2.3, Calculating Limits Using the Limit Laws. So in the last section, we started evaluating some limits, but we were only doing that using our calculator and graphs to guess some values. Now we're going to learn some properties to evaluate limits. Here are five basic limit laws. So we're supposing that c is a constant and we know the limit as x approaches a of f of x and the limit as x approaches a of g of x. They both exist. So then we can say number one is basically saying that the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. Number two is saying that the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. Number three is saying that when we want to do the limit of a constant times a function, we can pull that constant out and do the constant times the limit of the function. Number four is saying that the limit of a product is the product of the limits. And number five is saying that the limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits, provided that the denominator does not equal zero. So let's use those limit laws and this graph to evaluate. Okay, so in A, let's just use our limit laws first. So we're doing the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x plus the limit as x approaches negative 2 of 5 g of x. And the next step is that we can pull any constants out. So we have the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x plus 5 times the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x. Okay, and so now we can do some evaluating. We want to look as x approaches negative 2. So we're going to look right here on the graph, right, because that would be x is negative 2. So first we want to look at f of x, so that would be our pink function. So from the left we're going to 1, and from the right we're also going to 1. So that's going to just be 1 plus 5 times the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x. So let's look at the blue function, and from the left we're going to negative 1, and from the right we're going to negative 1. So we have 1 minus 5, which is negative 4. Now let's look at part B. So in part B, we know that the limit of the product is the product of the limits. And so now we don't want to look at x as negative 2. We want to look at x as 1. So we want to look around here. And so the pink function f of x uh, from the left is going to 2. From the right it's also going to 2. Great. Blue function from the left we're going to negative 2. But from the right we're going to negative 1. So remember how we said in the last section if the left hand limit and the right hand limit are not the same then the limit does not exist. So our answer does not exist. Then part C, let's just use our limit laws first. And now we're not looking at x1, we're looking at x equals 2, so that's right around there, x equals 2, right? So from the left we're going to like 1.5, from the right we're going to like 1.5, so that limit exists, great. And let's see the blue function, so from the left we're going to 0, from the right we're going to 0, that limit exists, fantastic. But uh, thou shall not divide by zero. So in this case, our answer is undefined. So here are some further limit properties, and they pretty much follow um, as you would figure. Let's just talk about number seven. It looks tricky, but it's really obvious. Let's look at um, an example. Let's say the limit as x approaches 
7, and let's just use 10 as our constant. Well, the limit as x approaches is 7 of 10. 10 is just the constant, so our answer is just 10. There is no variable even there, so we don't even care what x is approaching. So that's what 7 is saying. And number 8 is just saying something like, let's look at an example for that one. The limit as x approaches, let's say, 5, let's call a 5 of x. Well, as x approaches 5, x approaches 5. So that's going to just be 5. So that one's fairly obvious, too. It just looks a little tricky. OK, so let's use these limit laws to evaluate. So part A, let's just write it all out. The, we're going to push that limit through first minus the limit as x approaches 5 of 3x plus the limit as x approaches 5 of 4. And so we can pull a constant out. I'm going to kind of do two of them at once there, right? So I forgot to pull my constant out. And what is the limit as x approaches 5 of 4? Well, it's just 4, right? We don't care what x is approaching. There is no variable there. So we get 2 times 5 squared minus 3 times 5 plus 4, which is 50, which is 39. Now let's look at B. So we can just do our quotient here. All right. And so I'm going to just skip a couple steps. You're probably getting the hang of it now. negative 1 over 11. Okay, so what have we kind of learned here? Probably picked up on the fact that the fact is a polynomial or a rational function and a is in the domain of f, then the limit is just the function at that point. So basically, you know, if we don't see any holes in our function, if it just looks pretty normal, yeah, we can just use direct substitution, just plug in the value. And isn't that what we just saw in the last example? So functions with the direct substitution property are called continuous at A. And we're going to talk about the definition of continuity um, as we go on. Remember, not all limits can be evaluated by direct substitution. And why? Because oftentimes we'll have that hole or something like that. Find the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Well, what do you notice right away? You notice that you cannot just do direct substitution here. Because if you tried to, you would get 0 in the denominator. And we cannot divide by 0. So let's try factoring that top. And it is very necessary to rewrite this limit as x approaches 1 until we can actually do direct substitution. So we need to continue writing it. Um, how can we factor this top? Well, that's a difference of two squares. And we can simplify. And now that I've gotten rid of that denominator, I no longer have a restricted domain. I can now plug it directly in. Because I can plug the 1 directly in, I don't need to write the limit anymore. And my answer is just 2. So let's go back and look at this example that we did in the last section. And let's try and evaluate it now. So what should we do? Well, the problem is we can't use direct substitution because we would have a zero in the denominator. So we need to do something about it. Let's try and rationalize this in numerator. So what does that mean? Remember, you want to multiply and get the radical out of the numerator. 
usually we're rationalizing the denominator, but here we're going to try and rationalize the numerator just because it's something that we can do. Now remember, we cannot get rid of this limit until we can actually substitute, and since we still have a zero in the denominator, we cannot get rid of this limit. So we've got to keep writing it. Okay, so let's do FOIL here. So we get t squared plus 9 first. The outer and the inner, of course, going to cancel out. That was the purpose of multiplying by this. And our last is minus 9. Now, in these problems, don't multiply the bottom out. Just leave it. Okay? Just leave it as it is. Because if you do things right, something should probably cancel out very nicely. So what do we have left on our top? t squared plus 9 minus 9. Remember, you can't stop writing the limit yet because we cannot yet plug things, plug the 0 in. We would still be left with the 0 in the denominator. So we just have a t squared left on the top. And a second ago, I promised you that something would very nicely cross out with the top and the bottom. Yep, it just happened. So, what we've done is we've eliminated that zero on the bottom. Great, that means I can plug the zero in and get rid of that limit. So we get the square root of zero plus nine. I just plugged in the zero for the t which is equal to 1 over the square root of 9 is just 3 plus 3, which is 1 6. And isn't that what we did in the last section? We saw that it was 0 0.16667 about when we're using our calculator. Okay, so here's one more additional property. And it's going to seem confusing at first, but just bear with me for a couple of slides. And when we look at the picture, it's going to become very obvious what we're trying to say here. So, if f of x is less than or equal to g of x when x is near a, so we're just saying as we're getting close to this function of a, and the limit of f and g both exist as x approaches a, then the limit as x approaches a of f of x is less than or equal to the limit as x approaches a of g of x. So you're saying if the function f of x is below, let's just say, let's think of it graphically, it's below the g of x function, well then there, the limit of the f of x is also going to be below the limit of the g of x function. So this leads to the squeeze theorem, which is a very important theorem, and again, it looks tricky, but it makes a lot of sense if, if you understand it. So again, we're starting with some, kind of the same thing we were looking at just a minute ago. So we're saying if f of x is less than or equal to g of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. So here we have a nice picture. So we're saying the f function is the lowest one, and then the g is above it, and then the h is above it. And let's look at some value near a. So here's a. We see that they're coming close together near a. And we know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a of h of x. So what are we saying? We're saying the blue one, the limit at a, is equal, is the same as the limit of the yellow one. We knew that the, it went in order from lowest to highest. We knew that it went blue, pink, yellow. And now we're saying that at a, we know that the blue one, the limit, is equal to the yellow one. Well, that would have to mean that it also is equal to the pink one, right? Since the pink one was in the middle of the two. So that's called the squeeze theorem. Yeah, if we know that it goes f of x, g of x, h of x in order, and we know that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals the limit as x approaches a of h of x, then all three must be the same. So we want to show that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared times the sine of 1 over x equals 0. Problem is we can't use direct substitution. We get a 0 in the denominator. We don't really know what to do in this case. So what we do know is that the sine function is bounded by negative 1 and 1. Just quickly look at the sine function. 
it goes between 1 and 1 and it starts here and it has a period of 2 pi so I'm just going to graph from 0 to 2 pi for now okay and remember sine function looks like that we know that negative 1 is less than or equal to the sine function so in this case we want to look at the sine of 1 over x okay we know that it's bounded by negative 1 and 1 well we don't care about the sine of 1 over x we care about x squared times the sine of 1 over x right so what we want to do is just multiply everything by x squared, which we're allowed to do, just so we do it to everything. Since we know that x squared is positive, we don't have to worry. Let's try and use the squeeze theorem. So the squeeze theorem is saying if we know this limit and we know this limit and they happen to be the same, then we would know this limit. So we want to look at the limit as x approaches 0. Let's look at this one first. The limit as x approaches 0 of negative x squared is just going to be, we can pull the negative out if you want to. The limit as x approaches 0 of x squared and just put in the 0, negative 0 squared, which is just 0, right? Let's similarly do the same thing for this upper bound. You don't need to write this middle step out. I'm just writing it for you for now. Well, look at that. We know that this limit zero and this limit is zero. So we can say therefore, since the limit as x approaches zero of negative x squared equals the limit as x approaches zero of x squared, which equals zero by the squeeze theorem. We do need to write this by the squeeze theorem. Let's practice some good writing for the AP exam. I know we just started, but we're going to practice all year long. So since the limit is x approaches 0 of negative x squared equals the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared, which equals 0, by the squeeze theorem, it follows that the limit as x approaches 0 of x squared sine 1 over x, which was in between the two, has also got to be equal to 0. We just did a proof. And we can just look at this graphically since it looks kind of neat. What we just did was we looked at the function x squared and we looked at the function negative x squared, which was below it. And this happens to be the function y equals x squared sine of 1 over x. And uh, you can see the squeeze theorem in action there. That's it for this lesson.